Well, good morning, church. Uh, well, my name is Adam, and I'm the youth and young adult pastor here at First Baptist Surfside, and we're so glad that you have decided to worship with us this morning. Uh, if you happen to be a guest with us this morning, we're so glad you're here, uh, and we would love it if you would fill out one of the Connect cards. Uh, there should be one in the seat back in front of you. Uh, you can drop that in an offering plate when it goes by. Uh, we would love to just have a record of your visit and to reach out to see if we can answer any questions that you might have or uh, see if we can minister to you in some way. Uh, we did a few announcements this morning. Uh, first, we have two deadlines coming up next Sunday on November 13th. Uh, our shoe boxes are due, and as in addition to that, um, the uh, scarves and hats and gloves for the New York City mission trip are also due. Uh, so you got one more week to get those in. Uh, so if you didn't bring them today, uh, you have until next Sunday, or you can come on, uh, come by any time during this week to uh, drop them off at the church office. Also, on November 20th, we have coming up our uh, Discover class. This is a class for uh, new members who have not yet gone through the class, or for uh, those who are interested in membership here at First Baptist Church. Uh, so some of the things that we cover in that class are the history of our church. Uh, we cover some different doctrine that uh, sets us apart from other churches. Uh, and we also talk about ways that you can serve and get plugged in here. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up uh, and call the church office because we, we also provide lunch for you that day as well. Also on November 20th, uh, in the evening, we're going to have a guest speaker. So I hope you plan make plans to come back that evening. Uh, we have a missionary that's going to come and speak to us. Uh, her name is Ann Nagy, uh, and she serves as a missionary uh, in Southeast Asia. And so I hope you make plans to come back and hear from her about what God is doing in that region of the world uh, and in her ministry. So I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 13. And the Word of God says that love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man... I gave up childish ways, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Would you pray with me? So Heavenly Father, we love you, but only because you first loved us. And God, we see the greatest demonstration of love at the cross. God, you loved us enough to send your son uh, to pay the penalties that we deserve. And God, because of that, you are so patient with us and you were so kind toward us. God, you don't insist on your own way. You are not rude. Um, but God, we know that you are faithful to us. And Father, you don't keep a record of our wrongs because of the cross, that you've cast our sin as far as the east is from the west. And for that, God, we owe you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And so I pray that you would receive glory now as we worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. If y'all would, stand with us as we sing. Hideth my soul. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful 
wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. When, when clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock, wet shadows a dry, thirsty land. alone my hope is found he is the light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground burn through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still and striving cease He came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid Here in the death of Christ I live on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry. Commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here 
here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand Amen. Well, today is a special day. It's a special service uh, because today we are taking time to have parents and child dedication. And we use that title intentionally because we want to be clear about what parent and child dedication is and what it isn't. You see, this type of dedication plays no active role in the child's salvation. We want to be clear, the scripture is clear in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, that we are saved only by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. This is an action that each person must make individually and willfully choose. So we know that a young child or an infant is unable to make that type of decision for themselves. Therefore, we know that this type of dedication, it is not a child's baptism. It's not a christening or a means of salvation. It is merely a time for us to celebrate the child's life and pray that God would work in their lives. So today, the purpose of this dedication is threefold. Number one, it is to celebrate the life of Reagan Nixon and God's sovereignty over his life. We are so blessed that God brought Clea and Eric to be a part of our church family, and we're so excited as a church. I know when God brought Clea and Eric and Reagan together as a family. So we are celebrating the gift of Reagan Nixon. And we're also going to recognize the role of a parent, that God has ordained the family, the parents, to be the primary part of His plan. Parents are not replaceable, and they are the primary teacher in a child's life. I firmly believe that second to Christ Himself, what Reagan needs more than a good education more than to be successful in a sports team or to even have a good church. What Reagan needs second to Christ himself is a mom and a dad who love Jesus and walk with Jesus and seek to point him to Jesus. So today simply is an indication that Reagan is blessed to be raised in a home where mom and dad love Jesus and are faithful to bring him to be a part of the body of Christ and through this example of Eric and Clea, we pray that Reagan at a very young age which would give his life to Christ. The third purpose of this is to also recognize the role of what I would just simply call the village. You see, if we call ourselves the family church at the family beach, and we are not rallying around families and encouraging them and supporting them, then I would submit to you we have utterly failed in our task. Today we recognize also the extended family, the extended family of friends and family, and also us as an extended family as a church, that we are called to love and support the family and encourage them as they seek to raise Reagan in a Christian home. So at this time, I'm going to ask the parents, Eric and Clea, if they would bring Reagan and just step uh, toward the front here for a moment. At this point, I don't think they need much of an introduction, but everybody, this is Clea and Eric Nixon, and we love them so much as a church, and I'm simply going to begin by asking them a question, and Clea and Eric, if you promise to do this, we just simply ask you to say, we do. But Clea and Eric, do you promise to raise Reagan in a Christian home? Not a perfect home, but one that operates through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ to seek to exalt Jesus in everything that you do as a family? Will you model Christ by your personal conduct and in your marriage? Do you promise to teach Him the Word of God and to faithfully bring Him to church? If you would, would you say, we do? We do. And then secondly, I'm going to ask grandparents, extended family, special friends that have been specifically asked if you would stand for just a moment. 
Today we recognize that Clea and Eric are not in this alone. So do you today promise to help Eric and Clea fulfill the vow that they have just made to our church? Do you promise also to be an encouragement to Reagan in your life, in your words, and in your love? Do you promise also to always point him to Jesus? If you would do that, would you say we do? Amen. And then lastly, I'm recognizing that as a church, we play a major responsibility in Reagan's life as well. We're called to come alongside of this family and this extended family to love them and encourage them. So if you are a member of First Baptist Surfside, would you please stand at this moment? So if Eric and Clea are faithful to bring Reagan to church, do you promise to join them and teaching him to demonstrate to him what it means to be a faithful and godly member of a local church. Will you promise to lift this family before the Lord in prayer? And do you promise to set before them the example of Christ's likeness, love, and unity? If you do, would you say, we do? We do. Amen. Y'all may be seated, Clea and Eric. On behalf of our church, we love you. Uh, Lindsay Steelman, our children's director, has a small gift that she would like to present to you as simply a remembrance of this morning. And I just want to come and pray for you guys. But as a church, we just want you to know how much we love you and we're thankful for you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning that you've given us. God, we thank you for our church. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. Lord, we thank you for Clea and for Eric and just what they mean to our church family. And Lord, we thank you that in your sovereignty, you brought them together with Reagan. And Lord, what a beautiful family that they are. Lord, we thank you for him and pray that you would work within his life. Lord, we pray that at home he would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, that he would see in mom and dad how important their faith is. That it's not just something that they pretend to do on Sunday, but it is something that they live every moment of every day. And God, we would pray that you would work in Reagan's life, and Lord, that you would work within him, that at a young age, he might, through even his parents' example, give his life to Christ and walk with you all the days of his life. Lord, we pray that you would use him as he grows into a teenager, into a man, that you would use him to bless others in your name. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. But this time, our deacon Jerry Gilbert's going to come and pray for our offering. And then church, let's give and let's give joyfully and generously. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us to be here, Father. And we just uh, thank you for each person that's here, each family represented. Uh, we especially are, are welcome or any guest that we might have with us today, Father. And we pray that we're here for no other reason than to worship you in spirit and truth, Father. As we take up our offerings and our tithes, uh, we pray that you'll find us faithful to use them to lift up the name of Jesus and to reach the lost in this area. I ask all this in his precious and powerful and holy name. Amen. I'll never be more loved than I am right now wasn't holding you up so there's nothing I can do to let you down it doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now going through a storm but I won't go down I hear your voice Carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me out. You would cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown. You've never been closer than you are right now. You are Jaira. Never enough, 
always enough, more than enough. Don't want to forget how I feel right now on the mountaintop. I can see so clear what it's all about. Stay by my side when the sun goes down. Don't want to forget how I feel right now. Gyro, you are enough. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Well, this time we're going to dismiss our children through the third grade for Children's Church. They can meet there in the lobby and be taken to a time a little bit more age appropriate for them. But I do want to say a special thank you to our praise team. I could not think of a better segue into today's sermon as we simply ask the question Do you know what real love really is? Today we're going to take our Bibles and make our way to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, as we begin in verse 7 and make our way to the end of the chapter. 1 John 4, starting in verse 7. And today, Mr. Lee Ritchie is going to come and read our passage for us. Good morning. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born 
of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that <clears throat> he loved us and sent his son to be appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is so, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For, for, he, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of God. Thank you, Lee. What is love? It was a question asked to a group of children, what is love? And the children wrote down their responses. Here is what some of them had to say. Dallas, age seven, said that love is when your mom makes a cup of coffee for your dad, and she takes a sip of it before she gives it to him to make sure it's okay. Dennis, age five, said love is when a girl puts on perfume, a boy puts on aftershave, and they go out together and smell one another. <laughs> I guess Kelly and I have been doing it wrong this whole time. Sandy, age eight, said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over to paint her toenails anymore, so my granddad does it for her, even after he got arthritis too. That's love. Bruce, age eight, said, love is when you go out to dinner with someone and you give them most of your French fries without making them give you any of theirs in return. <laughs> You start giving away french fries, that is true love. We know that our world is obsessed with love. What is love? Where can I find love? Does anybody really love me? We're searching for love, but at the same time, I would submit to you that our world as a whole is arguably the most lonely, the most anxious, the most depressed generation that has ever been. Our world is starving for love. They're looking everywhere they can find for it. They can't seem to find it. Today, I want to submit to you that it is because most people are looking for love in all the wrong places. Today, we are continuing through the book of First John. Remember, John is the oldest living apostle at that time, and he is writing to the church as a whole, but also to us by extension, to encourage us that we might have confidence in our faith. Remember our key verse, 1 John 5, 13. He says, I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know, have confidence, assurance that you are in Christ. 
John's not writing to cause us to doubt. He's not writing to try to beat us up and make us feel like substandard Christians. No, he is writing for you to examine your heart between you and God alone, not with me, not with others in this room, to examine your life today and see that God is at work within you. Because what we have seen so clearly time and time again in this book is that just because you call yourself a Christian does not automatically make that statement true. No, what John has given us is roughly 10 different tests for you to examine your heart before God. How do you know that you are truly saved? How do you know that you are truly in Christ? What he has shown us is that true believers believe in the true gospel. This gospel radically transforms who we are from the inside out. Our actions are changed, yes, but our inward desires, our affections, our loves, our want-tos are made new in Christ. And this doesn't, doesn't happen for a day. No, because we are in Christ, He keeps us that we might persevere in our faith and grow to be more and more like Him. So today we are on test number eight. The simple question is, have you experienced true love? What John shows us is that this true love is not found out there in the world. It is found only in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. What he shows us is that true love comes from Jesus. It is demonstrated by him. And then when we experience this type of love, our lives are never the same as a result. So today we are going to consider five truths from this passage. The question I simply have for you today is as we go through these truths is, have you experienced this type of love? Number one. True love is from God. Look at verse 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, you're probably recognizing already that John is somewhat repetitive when he writes. In fact, 1 John has been described almost like a spiral where John kind of goes around and around in circles, but each time he gets to another point, he goes a little bit deeper than he did the time before. And so he is doing that with love. He's fleshing it out a little bit more, and we have to recognize that we are English speakers and that John was writing in the Greek. You see, in English, if we want to add emphasis as we're writing, especially in our modern age, how do we do that? Well, we put something in bold, all caps, underline, exclamation mark. That says that we really want to emphasize something that we're writing. John, on the other hand, in that day, if you wanted to emphasize something, you repeated it. You repeated it over and over again. And John has said and says again, if you are truly saved, love each other. Love each other love each other. By the way, have you heard? Love each other. I think you might be picking up by now that if you are a Christian, John expects you to love each other. Why? Because God is love. By His very character and nature, God is love. In the same way you think about something like water, water cannot get wet. Why? Because water is wet. In the same way, God cannot fall into love. Why? Because He is love. And if you claim to love God, then as a result, you therefore should love as God loves you. You find someone who does not love other people, John says it is because they have never truly experienced the love of God. So therefore, if you find someone who claims to be a Christian, yet stands on the side of the road and yells that God hates a particular group of people, John would say they don't know the love of God. You find someone who claims to be a Christian, yet refuses to forgive someone, 
is because they have not experienced the love of God. Don't tell me how much you love Jesus if you then don't go and love others. If you're treating others poorly in your life, don't talk about the love of Christ that you have. Now, a question you might have as you hear this is, well, pastor, we're talking about love, but how can John say, how can the Bible say that only Christians know what true love is? Because we know that if you look out in our world, even consider the the worst sinner that you could possibly imagine, they still love their children. They still love their spouse, their family. They still have love. So how can we say that the Bible says only Christians know true love? Well, two thoughts to that. Number one, we see in the text that it says God is love. That's a true statement. But the reverse of that statement is not necessarily true. God is love, but love is not God. So what do you mean by that? Our culture's definition of what love is and the biblical definition of love, I would submit to you, are so radically different that they are not even referring to the same thing. In our society, we have taken the concept of love as a concept and we worship it as if it were God. In our culture, who defines what love is? I do. You do. I can love whatever I want in any way that I want, and who are you to tell me that I am wrong? You see, our culture defines love as you have to fully accept and agree with every part of me, and if you don't, then you hate me and you are intolerant. But you see, in our society, they say, we would say that we can love in any way that we want, but here's the question that I would have. How do you know that what you love is really love? How do you know that it's real love and not just some selfish desire to satisfy a worldly pleasure? Because Jeremiah in the Bible is clear that our heart is deceitfully wicked, meaning that we cannot trust our own hearts often because it desires things that are not of God. Let me ask you, what happens when someone loves something that is harmful? If all society and of all of our love in our society is equal, then what do we say to someone who loves to murder somebody? Man, it felt good when I murdered that person. Or if they say, I love to cheat on my spouse, what would we say then? I would submit to you that a society cannot ultimately function in that way. God is love, but not all love is of God. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is that it is only through God that we know what true love really looks like. Again, we are English speakers, and so in the English, how many words do we have for love? Well, one, love. That puts us at somewhat of a disadvantage because we use that word love for almost anything. The same word, I love God, I love my spouse, I love my children, I love Chick-fil-A, I love my dog, I love the Gamecocks, all of those things. I use the same word to refer to all of those different things, but we would automatically know that those loves are not all the same. There's differences between them. The Greeks had an advantage because they had several words for love. They had the word phileo which was a brotherly type of love. It was nothing romantic about it, but it was the love between friends. That's why the city of Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. That's where the name comes from. Or we have the type of love, eros, which was a romantic type of love. John says there's another type of love that only ultimately comes from God. That is a agape type of love. That is an unconditional type of love. You see, conditional love says, I love you because, fill in the blank. I love you because you're nice. I love you because you are beautiful. I love you because you help me in some way. No, God says, I love you because I love you. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. If you are in Christ, 
I love how David Allen says it. He says, God loves me, not because I am I, but because He is He. John says it is only when someone experiences that type of unconditional, sacrificial love that we truly have a full understanding of what love is. So we see love is ultimately from God, but secondly what we see is that true love is seen. The world asks, where can I find love? And they look everywhere for it. In relationships, in in media, books, all over this world, they're looking for love. But notice verse 9. John says, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. You see, at that moment, the love of God is not a theoretical feeling. It is not a pie-in-the-sky emotional feeling that we have for someone else. No, love was manifest. Love was seen. Love was visible. You see, Jesus is the perfect embodiment of God Himself and therefore is the perfect embodiment of love. Love is no longer a concept or a theory. No, love is has hands. Love has feet. Love came to us that we might live through Him, which implies apart from the love of God, we are not alive, we are dead. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. We know that God created the world and He created it good. In creation, there was goodness, there was order, there was logic, there was purpose built in within it. And God said, if you live according to my commands, then it will be well with you. It will be well with your children. But we all know that our first parents, Adam and Eve, and we would have done nothing different, said, no, God, I know better than you. God, I don't want to do things your way. I want to do things my way because God, I know better than you. We call that sin. And as a result, we know that now our world, the Bible says, is fundamentally broken. And I don't think many people would argue with that. Turn on the news today, and in about 0.2 seconds, you're going to see that we have a broken world. Pain, suffering, another shooting, another natural disaster. Why do bad things happen? The Bible says it is because we as a humanity have turned our backs on God, the very source of life. We live in a broken world, but the Bible then takes it a step further and says the brokenness isn't just out there. Don't point your fingers at them. No, the brokenness is within us. We are broken. That's why depression, anxiety, mental health issues, I would submit to you, are at an all-time high. Now, I know that there are likely certainly many factors that play into that, but I would submit to you is that it is a, at the root is a world that is desperately seeking for love and cannot find it. They search for love place after place, person after person, and they conclude that if I cannot find love, then maybe I am unlovable. The Bible says we are broken. We are selfish. We are sinners. We are rebels against God Himself. And not only then are we then broken people, we are rebels that have offended God Himself. God is love, yes, but at the same time, the Bible says God is just and God is holy which means that He is love, but His love does not supersede His justice. No, His love and His justice go hand in hand. God loves that which is just. He loves that which is good. Therefore, we have broken His law. We have sinned against Him, and we deserve the just punishment that is due us. We deserve not to go to heaven. We deserve to spend an eternity in hell. The question that we have to ask then is, how can God forgive us? 
How can we find reconciliation with God? Some might say, well, it's because God is a good God. He is a merciful God. He will simply forgive me if I ask Him. Well, take that logic and apply it to a judge in our world today. Think of the worst criminal that you could possibly imagine standing before that judge, and the judge says, why should I let you go? And that criminal says, well, judge, it's because you're a good judge. You're a a kind man. You're a merciful man, so you will forgive me and let me go. Would that be goodness? No. Would that be justice? Not at all. No, we would say that is injustice. The law has been broken. There is a penalty to that crime. In the same way, we have broken the law of a holy God. God's wrath, His just wrath, is against us who have sinned against Him. We deserve the penalty. We deserve hell. But that is where I would submit to you where true love is really found. Because notice with me in verse 10. He says, In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, think about you in a relationship in your life. If somebody offends somebody else, Who typically should be the one that that initiates the reconciliation? It would be the offender. The one that did something wrong typically should go to that person and seek reconciliation. For God, it's the exact opposite. We offended Him, yet He initiates reconciliation. Because we in our sin, you see, sin is not just doing bad things. Sin is a rebellion against God in His name. We were haters of God, the Bible says, but even while we hated Him, He loves us and demonstrates His love for us by sending His own Son. Now hear me well this morning. I love you. Every person in this room, I love you. Even if we have not met yet, I I love you in the name of Christ. But it does not matter how much I love you, I would not give one single one of my children for you. I would not allow Jason or Danielle to even be harmed for you. I love you, but I don't love you to that level. God, on the other hand, sent His Son, His only Son, to live the life that we could not live so that He would die the death that we deserve. He went to the cross, and verse 10 says He was the propitiation for our sins. I know that's not a common word that we use. It simply means that Jesus took your place. He paid the penalty that you deserve. He paid the wrath of God that you deserve. Isaiah 53 says it pleased God to bruise Him on our behalf. He died for you so that your case could legally be dismissed. God says, therefore, I love you, not because you are a good person or because you are religious. He says, I love you because of what Jesus has done on the cross. Notice verse 12. He says it this way. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. Many want to question, where is God? Is there even a God? I can't see Him. Where is He? John says you cannot see God with your eyes, but when you experience His love, it removes all doubt that there is a God. When you experience His mercy, His forgiveness, and His love, that today, if you would simply repent from your sin and turn and surrender your life in faith to Jesus, then you would be forgiven, and you would be loved by the God of the universe. And I want to submit to you that that changes absolutely everything. And that's the third thing that we see here. True love is comforting. Our standing with God changes everything in our lives. Look at verse 15. He says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Here's the gospel. 
You were lost, dead in your trespasses and sin, rebelling against God. And yet, He loves you. He pursues you. He died for you. And today, through faith, not only has He forgiven you, given you new life, but He has now adopted you into His family. He has taken the rebel and made him a son or a daughter of the king. What type of comfort should that give us? It's a reminder that God, John says, yes, has forgiven me. Therefore, if God has forgiven me, I am no longer defined by my past. I am released from my shame and my guilt. Think about when you hurt somebody. Maybe there's a riff in a relationship that you have. At some point, if that person looks you in the eye and says, I forgive you, What kind of joy, freedom does that give? In the same way, when God says, I forgive you, that changes absolutely everything. God has forgiven us. He has also given us a new identity. Think about in the world, how do we identify ourselves? Our world identifies ourselves by our gender, by our skin color, by the bank account that we have. In Christ, that changes everything. In Christ, you are no longer identified primarily by your ethnicity or your political affiliation. Now you are a son or a daughter of the Most High King. You see, now I am no longer primarily a white male, a husband, a father. I am those things, but first and foremost, I am a Christ follower. First and foremost, I am a Christian who happens to be white, who happens to be a male. Today, I imagine in this room, someone here needs to hear this. Hear me well. You are important. You have value. You were made in the image and the likeness of God. Your life has purpose. He simply wants you to surrender your life to Him. And then you can rest not in what you think of yourself or what society says about you. You can rest in what God has declared of you as His son or as His daughter. We're given a new identity. We're also given a new purpose. My purpose in life now is not to simply pursue worldly happiness and pleasure. My purpose in life is to serve my Heavenly Father. You see, I think what John is saying is that we can talk a lot about love and the love of God, but until you have actually experienced this love, it's hard to comprehend it. It's hard to wrap your mind around it. You see, John uses this word, abide. Abide, that God abides with us, in us, that He is with you, that He stays with you. He is long-suffering towards you. Meaning that as you go throughout life and you experience the ups and the downs of life, if you are hit with every direction and you feel like giving up, it's in those moments that God pulls you close to Him and reminds you that He is still there. That you still belong to Him. That He still loves you. And it is in those moments that God's love is perfected within us. Not that we become perfect. No, we're far from that. But that then we know and experience what true love really looks like. You see, true love is when someone knows you, the real you, and still loves you anyways. I would submit to you that's why so many marriages fail. It's because so many marriages are not built on true love. Many marriages are are built on happiness or some felt need within us. I'm thankful that Kelly Sweet loves me. The real me. You see, I can fool every person in this room except one and she's sitting in the back. She knows the real me. She knows everything about me. She has seen me at my best and at my worst. She knows my strengths. She knows my weaknesses. She has seen me at my most vulnerable and at my weakest. And yet, she still loves me. How much more sweet is it to know that the God of heaven 
knows you. The real you knows you better than any family member will ever know you. He knows your quirks. He knows your your temptations, your thoughts, all of your desires. And yet through Christ, he still says, I love you. I can't put it any better than Charles Spurgeon, who said it this way. It is a very sweet thing to feel that we have the love of a dear wife or a kind husband. And there is much sweetness in the love of a child or a tender mother. But think, God loves me. This is infinitely better. Who is it that loves you? God, the maker of heaven and earth, the almighty, all in all. Does he love me? If all men loved me, it were nothing to this. The infinite loves me. And who is it that he loves? Me. He loves me, an insignificant nobody, full of sin, who deserved to be in hell, who loves him so little in return. God loves me. I don't know what else to give you comfort with this morning. That to know that God no, does not promise that he will fix the problems in your life or that all pain will go away. No, in fact, he promises the opposite. But to know that no matter what you go through in life, God is there with you. True love gives comfort. Fourth, true love is assuring. Look at verse 17. He says, by this is love perfected with us so that we might have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Let's be honest. We all have fears. We are all worried or anxious about things in life at times. John says, what is it that casts out that fear? Love. Specifically, God's love for us. Meaning that I don't have to fear what life throws at me because no matter what I lose in this life, I have the riches of God's love. No matter what someone else says about me, God says, Nathan is mine. We therefore can rest not in our ability, but in the perfect plan of God. We don't have to fear this life because John says, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. We can have confidence in this life, but especially, he says, on the day of judgment. I'll never forget, I was a senior in high school. I was in English class. My teacher was actually Miss English. That was her name. And over the loudspeaker came on Miss English please send Nathan Sweet to the principal's office. What did the class do? You heard the, ooh, you've done it now. Nathan, what'd you do? Come on, tell us. We want to know. We want to know the, 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 the details. What happened? Well, I laughed and I kind of went out of the room. You see, most people, when you're called to the principal's office, there's fear. Why? Fear of punishment. What did I do wrong? What are the ramifications of it? But as I walked to the principal's office, I actually had no fear. I was actually looking forward to it. Why? Because I knew the principal. He knew me. Brian Sherman, our assistant principal, loved me. He was a member of our church. He actually was a leader in our youth group. On Sunday nights, my principal told me about Jesus. So as I went to Mr. Sherman's office, I had no fear. In fact, I was confident that it was going to be something good. In fact, he sat me down for 30 minutes. We talked about school. We talked about church. He simply wanted to know about a youth event we were going to have at church that weekend. Why? I knew him. He knew me. That love cast out all fear. One day we will stand before God on judgment day. And every single one of us will stand trembling before Him. But how we tremble will be dependent on our relationship to Christ. Those who do not know Him, God says, the Bible says, will tremble as a result of the fear of punishment. Their sin laid bare. The Father will look to the Son and the Son will say, I do not know this one. And the Father will say, depart from me. I never knew you. But those who do know Christ, the Bible says, yes, we will stand trembling before the majesty of an infinite God. Our sins will be laid bare and that will not be a pretty sight. But at that moment, the Father will look to the Son and the Son will say, no, this one is mine. 
I know this one. And the Father then will turn to us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Our trembling will then turn to praise and worship and adoration for the love of God that He has shown us. You see, the love of God removes fear because we know Him. The last thing today is this. True love is transformational. You see, Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors, yes. But He did not do so to condone their actions, but to call them to repentance, that they might have new life in Him. And as a result, we who have experienced the love of Christ, John says in the Word is clear, we are never the same, especially in how we treat other people. Verse 19 says, we love because He first loved us. Go back to verse 11. It says, Beloved, if God has so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We who have been so loved by the God of heaven, how can we not then love others in return? In our world, most people love others dependent on how they respond to them. If someone wrongs you or hurts you, or if someone's a negative influence in your life, just cut them off our world says. But you see, the agape love of God says, I can love you, not because of you, not even because of me, but I can love you because God is love. And I'll be honest, we know that type of love does not come naturally. As one person said it, we can fall in love, but we cannot fall into agape. Because it is not a natural thing. It is an intentional choice that we have to make. I love David Allen as he thinks about John 13 where Jesus tells his disciples to love each other. He says, picture the scene as John looks at Peter and thinks, you mean I have to love that loudmouth? Matthew looks at Thomas and thinks, I have to love that skeptic? Thomas looks at Matthew and says, I have to love that tax collector? And yet we know that it was that unconditional type of love that changed the world as we know it. Church, what's going to impact this community for Christ? What is going to impact those that need to hear about Christ? It's not going to be our buildings. It's not going to be our music. It's not going to be our preaching. It's not going to be our events. It's not going to be our programs. What ultimately will impact this community for Christ is our love. Do we love others? Unfortunately, we know that many people think of Christians as judgmental, condescending hypocrites who talk so much about love and don't show it. Let's be honest, in many cases, that's 100% true. There's a reason why many people would want to go on the weekend to the bar and not go to church. Because you see, at the bar, you're loved and welcomed for just who you are. Many people instead come to church hoping to find love, wanting to find someone that loves them. Instead, what do they find? People who would look down their nose on them because of how they're dressed, or what their skin color is, or if they have a tattoo on their arm. People that say they love others, but love their traditions and their styles more than other people. Jesus says, come just as you are, but most churches say, yeah, come just as you are, as long as as you are is how I am. You can come in here as long as you look and act and dress and think just like I do. John says, no one has seen God. How then is God made visible? Through your love. You are the hands and the feet of God. You make the love of God visible for the world to see. As one person put it, agape love seeks the highest good in other people. You see, agape love says, I can look past my culture. I can look past my traditions of what they say about you. Instead, I can see you how God sees you. Agape love is, I will love you. Yes, I will love you for who you are, but ultimately I will meet you where you are so that then I can share with you your greatest good, even if it may hurt. 
I love the story of the interview that Penn Jillette gave. Penn Jillette is a famous magician, and what he said in the interview one day has stuck with me my entire life. Penn Jillette is an atheist, and yet he said one day after a show, a man came up to him. The man was kind. He was not judgmental or condescending. He simply gave Penn the gospel track and took about five minutes to tell him the love of Jesus. Now, did Penn give his life to Christ? No, he did not. But what he said has stuck with me forever. He said, you know, I don't really believe what this man believes, but I respect him. He said, I respect him because, quote, if you truly believe in a literal hell, how much do you have to hate someone not to tell them about Jesus? If you literally believe in a heaven and a hell and God and Christ, how much do you have to hate someone not to tell them about Jesus? What is the most loving thing we can do is simply to allow someone just to continue in a life of sin or to tell them of the love of a God and came in the person and the work of Jesus and that if they put their faith in Him, they would be made new. They would be forgiven and granted everlasting life. So today, as I conclude, I simply have two questions. Number one, to those in this room who claim to be Christians, my simple question is, how's your love? How well are you loving other people? I'm not asking how well do you love people that are like you, but how well do you love people that are exactly opposite of you? As one author put it, your spiritual maturity is not measured by your age or how long you've been in a church, or how much money you give to the church. No, your spiritual maturity is measured by one thing. How well do you love other people? And to those in this room that would say, Pastor, I don't know Christ. By the way, if you're not a Christian in this room, you're welcome here. We're glad you're here. But today, if you do not know Christ and you have not truly experienced the love of God and you have tried to find love in everywhere else in this world, my simple question to you would be, is how is that working out? Is it working? Have you experienced the love of a Father who came to die for you? Today, God wants to meet you where you are, not so that you might remain the same, but that you might experience life and life abundant in him god loves you and he wants you to come home to him today would you pray with me father we thank you for your word and god i thank you that you do love me because lord i know that there's nothing lovable within nathan lord i thank you that you chose to love me you chose to die for you you chose to make me new god i pray that as a church we would anew and afresh lord be radically impacted by that truth. Lord, we're unlovable. There's nothing good within us. Help us to love others the same way. Lord, forgive us where we have failed in that so many times. Lord, I pray that our community would think about First Baptist Surfside. They wouldn't think about our events or our programs or anything like that. But Lord, they would think about our love. They might know that there are people in that church that may not agree with everything we agree with or or do everything the way we do things, but those people, they love me. And God, I pray for that person in this room that does not know you as Lord and Savior. God, I pray that you today would meet them where they are. Lord, I don't believe it's a coincidence that they are here today. God, I pray that you would meet them where they are and help them to know that you love them and that you desire a relationship with them through Jesus today. Father, we thank you, and we love you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing our song of response. This isn't the time to rush on to lunch. No, in fact, to me, this might be the most important part of our service, because you've heard the Word, but what good is it to be a hearer of the Word and not a doer of the Word? So today, my challenge would be, is before you leave here today, as Mike sings, ask God, how do I need to respond to this? Maybe for some, it is to give your life to Christ today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. For some, it might be something you need to do in the pew between you and God. Maybe it's something you need to do when you leave here today. Maybe for some, you want to come and pray with Adam or myself or join and be a part of our church family. But whatever the case is, let me simply challenge you not to leave here today without walking in obedience. 
Would you stand and would you sing? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed. Amen. If you would be seated just for a quick moment, I have some good news I'd like to share with you. Uh, Liz, if you want to come and just stand by me just for a moment. Um, Everybody, this is Liz Bonson. She might not need a lot of introduction. She's been a part of our church family now for some time and has already been such a blessing to me serving in so many different ways. But everybody, Liz comes today to make it official. She wants to join and be a part of First Baptist Surfside. So if you would affirm here, can I hear a loud amen? Amen. Liz, we do love you and we're thankful to have you. Church afterwards, come up and welcome her. Introduce yourself if you don't know her. Um, And as a quick reminder, if you're part of our outreach team that goes out on Sunday nights, remember tonight we are meeting at 4.30, not 5.30. So just remember that just for tonight only. So today we thank you for coming. We've gathered as the church. Let's go and be the church. Have a blessed day.